Yes, yeah, so my name is Professor Jeff Strange um, from the School of Medicine at the University of Notre Dame. And today we're going to be talking about a change in ejection fraction and the complications for mortality in 117,275 cases. So the background of this particular study is based on a project we conceived more than five years ago called the National Echo Database of Australia, so-called NEDA. And NEDA itself is a vendor agnostic unselected cohort of echocardiograms from the real world that links cardiac structure and function to mortality. It's an Australian wide network of centres and the methodology of this study has been previously published in the American Heart Journal. So NEDA itself is a cohort study looking at real world echocardiographic data produced from more than 30 centres across Australia and all those data of echocardiographic parameters are linked to mortality. In this instance, we've got 631,824 individuals, and of those individuals representing more than 1,077,000 investigations. So as described, 1,077,000 investigations on 631,824 individuals representing 299,000 women and 332,000 men with a median age of 61 and 60 respectively. We removed 151,000 cases where we were unable to quantify the exact left ventricular ejection fraction. And that left us with 493,000 individuals. And of those individuals, we removed 375,000 cases where there was not a consecutive follow-up of echocardiography derived left ventricular ejection fraction within a window of greater than six months. So our findings from this study were that we ended up with 117,275 individual patients where we had both an index procedure and a change in outcome that was greater than six months using the same, from the same lab using the same methodology. We were able to demonstrate that there's a median index ejection fraction of 62 across the cohort, and we had equal numbers of patients that had an improvement over the ensuing follow-up period, nearly eight years of follow-up, versus those that had an, a decrease in their ejection fraction. Our cohort, we were able to look at those patients that had severe impairment of ejection fraction, moderate impairment of ejection fraction, mildly impaired ejection fraction, and what is so-called normal. And we looked at this from two different spectrums. One is that we looked at a five unit change in ejection fraction and the rate of change related to mortality. And the second a priori hypothesis was to look at the statistical distribution of those patients that presented in each of those severe, mild or moderate categories and evaluate their relationship of change in ejection fraction to mortality. In this case, what we found was that there was a, an emergence of a safe zone so those changes uh, appeared to occur at somewhere between 55 and 60% of the change patient's ejection fractions. Even a small change of those patients that presented with severe impairment of ejection fraction, a small change was statistically significant for improvements in mortality. However, once patients moved into the safe zone, there was an obvious pivot point of increasing mortality once patients moved out of the safe zone, again, around 55 to 60 to 65% of left ventricular ejection fraction. So I think the conclusions of our current work really imply that small changes 
in left ventricular ejection fraction, rep, injection fraction represent an important indicator for success or otherwise of the chosen management strategy for that individual. And even modest changes in either direction, depending on where you start, were associated with significant differences in cardiovascular related mortality. Secondarily, we found that a safe zone or a plateau of reduced mortality appeared at an ejection fraction approximately 55 to 60%. And really clinical trials are now needed to evaluate the cost to benefit ratio of regularly evaluating ejection fraction as a guide for a treat to target management strategy for this population. And that needs to be a treat to target at a much higher threshold than we've previously thought. The take home message I think from this study really is that a treat to target strategy of pushing patients to a safe zone of ejection fraction of those patients that present with impaired left ventricular uh, function or diastolic dysfunction to push patients towards a safe zone of 55 to 60% uh, will become an important strategy in ensuring the best possible outcome for individuals. So I think the future implications of these data um, are subject to its limitations, and that is that the data set itself does not yet capture all of important clinical comorbid conditions. We are unable to comment on the role of treatments such as neurohormonal modulating therapies or cardiac resynchronization, for example, and we're unable to adjudicate on the inter and intra test reliability. We did do a series of sensitivity analyses on this population, looking at time dependent variables, looking at the method of ejection fraction quantification, the final versus the first ejection fraction, specific subgroups, for example, those with valvular heart disease and those data within specific centres. However, without the detailed granular clinical comorbidity, uh, final conclusions within this population are yet to be drawn. And so the next steps for us is to link these 1, million in, these 1 million echoes, 630,000 individuals to hospitalization, healthcare service utilization and medical therapies. And we intend to do that in the coming 12 months.